Thanks for joining us for this YouTube service from Mutho with Trinity Gask and Kinkel for Sunday the 4th of July. Today's hymns are Be Still for the Presence of the Lord, Spirit of God and a well-known favourite When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. We're continuing to read in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 8 verses 26 to 40, thinking about the Ethiopian eunuch who sought God. And the title of the sermon is Seek and You Will Find. There's one intimation. Over the next three Sundays, there won't be YouTube services. I'm going to be on holiday and they'll resume when I get back. In the meantime, of course, the church services are still taking place and you're welcome in Trinity Gask at 10 a.m. or Mutho at 11.30. We're now allowed to sing. Still wearing masks, of course. Hope you enjoy this service. bring ourselves before God in prayer. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, at the start of our worship we present ourselves before your throne of grace. You are the Sovereign Lord, the Maker of all that exists, the Sustainer of creation, the Saviour and the Judge of the living and the dead. We worship you because you made us unique among all the creatures of our world. We alone have minds to understand that you are God and hearts to fully respond to that awesome knowledge. In Jesus you have shown us your care and compassion, your love and mercy. Father, we have to admit that our hearts and minds are not always in tune with you. Our thoughts can stray far from the path you have shown us. Our hearts run after all kinds of things that are not worthy. Unlike Jesus, we are guilty of a lack of care, of being unfeeling, 
of loving ourselves and our own ease, too much to show mercy and kindness to those in need. We are easily hurt and offended because our own small egos are more important than the truth. We get angry at things in others that we ourselves are prone to. Heavenly Father, you made us and know us, and yet you still love us. We find it hard to believe, but pray that you would give us the faith now to believe that if we admit our faults to you, you are able and willing to forgive. We pray also that as you reveal our faults to us, you would help us overcome them by the help of your Spirit and the example of Jesus. And so help us worship you now as we receive your grace and are filled with your love and inspired to be better children and disciples. For we ask it in Jesus' name and pray in the words he taught us, saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Three. Philip and the Ethiopian. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuchs asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture, and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Thanks be to God for his reading of this holy word.
Yesterday we met my, my son and his, his son, my grandson, four-year-old Ezra, and we had, we had lunch and then afterwards the wee park, and Ezra and I were playing hide-and-seek. Hide-and-seek. Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God first. Jeremiah said about God, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Moses predicted a time when the people of God, the people of Israel, would be scattered among all the nations and fall away from God. But even there, Moses said, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. God isn't actually playing hide and seek with us. He's not hiding from us, but he wants us nevertheless to seek him, to find him. God isn't hiding from us. It's the very opposite. We've been hiding from God. Go back to the very beginning, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what did they do? They hid from God behind a bush. We've been hiding ever since. And God is calling to us to come out from where we're hiding, to seek him and to find him. And we will, if we seek him with all our hearts. In Acts chapter 8, we read a story of a man who was seeking God with all his heart. This Ethiopian eunuch, a seeker after truth. And the story tells us how God was found by him and how God let himself be found through a man called Philip. Philip was one of the leaders of the early church. He was involved in a very successful mission in Samaria, north of Jerusalem. Lots of people were coming to their faith, lots of work going on, teaching disciples and, uh, and uh, continuing to, to preach and to minister there. And then God says to Philip, I've got another wee job for you. I want you to leave here, this successful, busy place, and I want you to go to the road going south from Jerusalem at Gaza, the desert road. The translation, the road that goes south, could also be translated, go at noon, when the sun is in the south. And a lot of folk think that's exactly the, the translation it should be. At noon, go to this, this road. This is actually the international highway between the south and the north and, and, the, and the east and the west. But at noon, any sensible travellers in that desert place will be having their siesta. There won't be anybody in the road. But that was what Philip was told. Go to this deserted desert road. And Philip, being a man of God, did. And what he saw was a caravan of travellers heading south. Not just any old travellers. This was the Ethiopian eunuch who was the chancellor of the, the queen of Ethiopia in charge of all her treasury. When it says Ethiopia, it possibly it would be modern Sudan, just south of, of Egypt, a long way. But this man had just been to Jerusalem to worship God, to go to the temple, to seek God. That was a, a long, long journey from the south of uh, Egypt, Sudan or, or Ethiopia. Many, many months, possibly therefore, I think, a once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage. And the irony is that once this eunuch had got to Jerusalem, had, could, could see the temple, he wasn't allowed in it because he was a eunuch. And there were rules about who could and couldn't go into the temple. Remember the story of Peter and John and the crippled man at the gate of the temple, begging from people. He too couldn't go in because he was a cripple. And we read that story and we think that's dreadful, that's discrimination against disabled people. But we need to see what the story is really telling us about the temple. It's not telling us about discrimination against disabled people. It's telling us about the holiness of God. 
the purity of God. And even able-bodied people and well-qualified people couldn't just barge into God's presence. Even the high priest, when he went into the temple, had to purify himself, had to wash, had to put on specially sanctified linen, had to offer sacrifices before he could go into God's presence. But there was a prophecy in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 56, verses 3 and 4, which says that that will change one day. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am but a dry tree. Then Isaiah goes on to give a promise. They will all be welcomed in God's house, the house of prayer for all nations, whoever they are, wherever they come from, whatever their situation, their disability, the color of their skin, all will be made welcome in God's house if they seek him as this man sought him. He just traveled from the south of beyond Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan, whatever it was. It was at least a journey of a thousand miles. And he wouldn't just have come on his own. He would have come with an entourage of servants because he was such a wealthy and important man, possibly soldiers to protect him. He maybe had uh, offerings and gifts he was going to give, so he had money he had to look after. And they would have gone at walking pace. We're talking about distance. Two, possibly three times the distance from Edinburgh to London. Each way. This man was serious about seeking God. And when we think about that journey, what about our journey? Our spiritual pilgrimage? How far have we come? How far would we go to find God? What would we pay? What sacrifices would we make? There's been a long tradition in the Christian church of pilgrimages, people going long distances to holy places or to meet holy people to try and find God. But the truth is that God is closer to us than we imagine. But how do you connect with God? How do you come out of our hiding places to find the God who is actually seeking us? Acts chapter 8 tells us, on the way back from Jerusalem, this Ethiopian eunuch was traveling along it, rumbling along it, walking pace, doing what any of us would do if we're going on a big, long journey, sitting on a plane for hours or a train or whatever. He was reading a good book. It happened to be the Bible. Again, going back 2,000 years, books, you, you didn't buy them at the... At the uh, um, at the railway station or wherever, they weren't readily available. They were very expensive, very rare. This was a wealthy man, obviously. Whether he'd bought this book in Jerusalem or whether he owned it, I don't know. But he was reading in the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. And Philip, in the middle of this desert, surprised to find this caravan of travellers, went up to the carriage where this man was sitting, reading Isaiah. And Philip recognized right away, of course, this was the prophecy from the Old Testament. And Philip really took his life in his hands, actually, by addressing this extremely important uh, official. And he asked him whether he understood what he was reading. And the eunuch said, how can I? Somebody needs to explain it to me. I want to know what it means. If we're seeking God, a good place to start is the Bible. And to have that desire in our hearts to understand what it says. What is God saying to me here? How can I find him? It's no coincidence that the very first printing press, Gutenberg's press, printed a Bible. And ever since then, the Bible Society has been printing hundreds, thousands, millions of Bibles to get Bibles into people's hands that they can read for themselves how we can find God. 
And so the Ethiopian eunuch was reading in Isaiah, Isaiah 53. The passage read, He was led like a sheep to be slaughtered, and like a lamb that is dumb before the shearers, he does not open his mouth. He has been humiliated, and has no redress. Who will be able to speak of his posterity? For he is cut off from the world of living men. And the question was, who is this uh, prophet speaking about? Is it himself? That was one translation, or one interpretation. He was speaking about himself. People didn't believe him. He felt like a lamb being led to the slaughter. Is it the people of Israel, perhaps? Because that was another interpretation. The people of Israel being attacked on all sides by enemies. Or is it somebody else? Interestingly enough, the Jews did not translate this passage ever as applying to the Messiah. For them, the Messiah was a great victor, the saviour of the people, not somebody who would ever die ignominiously like a lamb at the slaughter. So Philip climbed into the carriage at the invitation of the Ethiopian eunuch and they had a Bible study together. The Ethiopian eunuch asked, said, how can I understand this unless someone gives me a clue? And Philip could tell him the clue is Jesus. The events that have taken place in a very recent history. And probably, I can imagine that if the Ethiopian eunuch had been any length of time in Jerusalem, he must have heard the stories about this would-be Messiah from Galilee who came to Jerusalem, was crucified, and then the wild rumour started of his resurrection, he came back to life. He must have heard these stories. And Philip would tell him that these stories fit exactly what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53. The lamb that comes to his, his shearer comes meekly. The lamb that goes to be sacrificed doesn't know what's about to happen to it. It doesn't complain. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him when he travelled to Jerusalem, how his enemies were plotting against him. He still went. When Jesus was arrested, he didn't stop them arresting him. He told his disciples, he put that sword away. This has got to happen. When he stood in, in, in trial in front of Pilate and that verdict was given, crucify him, he didn't appeal to Caesar to try and get off the hook. He let it all happen to him. Just as Isaiah had predicted. And that was all in very recent history. This prophecy, Philip could tell the Ethiopian eunuch, is all about Jesus. And then he would go on to say, you've been to the temple, you've worshipped at the temple, perhaps you've even paid for a lamb or maybe a, a bull or something more expensive to be able to offer that as a sacrifice on your behalf in the temple. And Philip would tell the Ethiopian that the blood of animals does not take away our sins before God. There's only one sacrifice, the lamb that God himself provided, Jesus, and his death on the cross alone can take away our sins. And as Philip explained all that to the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch believed what Philip said. And as they were travelling along in the carriage, they saw some water. I don't know if Philip had been talking to the Ethiopian eunuch about baptism, but they suddenly said to, to Philip, there's some water, I could get baptised now. What's to stop me? I believe what you say. And so they got off the carriage, Philip baptised the eunuch there and then. Seek and you will find, Jesus said. And if you seek and if you find you need to do what the eunuch did. Seize that moment. What's to stop me being baptised now? Making that commitment visible in public now to Jesus. And if you seek and you find, hold on to what you find now. If God speaks to you, listen now. If God prompts you, follow that prompting now. Don't put it off till tomorrow, next week. That voice might fade away. That heart which has been warmed might get cold again. You need to do it now. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, Now 
is the day of salvation. When the love of God touches you, you need to let it melt you. Put your faith, your trust in him. Make that commitment, that decision there and then. And if you do, your experience will be like that of the Ethiopian. It says that after he was baptised, he went happily on his way, it says in the New English Bible. Others say he went full of joy. We can know that joy of God. And take it with us like he did in his journey back south. We can take that joy with us on the rest of our journey through the rest of our days. Today could be the first day, is the first day of the rest of your life. And it could be spent with Jesus. Let's again come before God as we bring him our prayers for others. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we've been praying a lot about ourselves and how we are, are or are not coping with COVID in our nation or our parish or our, our homes. Lord, we think now of those in other parts of the world who are always coping with serious situations. We think of those still living with leprosy, their families and communities. Thank you for the medical treatments available, and we pray that those who need them will get access to them. We think of those nations in the world where polio is still a great danger, and give you thanks for the global campaign to eradicate it, and pray that it might continue to progress. We pray for those at the forefront of reaching these communities where polio still exists, in order to provide the vaccine that will stop it. We lift up to you the nations still plagued with malaria, and pray for the researchers trying to find ways to stop it being transmitted, and for the resources to get the cheap treatments that are available to those who need it most. We pray for those fighting to end TB by 2030 throughout this whole world. Lord, we ask for help for those campaigning for clean water in the world, who have the engineering skills to dig wells, and to be able to teach people how to maintain them, so that people have access to water that is not contaminated with parasites or diseases. Lord, we are grateful that we don't have to deal with all these conditions, and that our lockdown is easing and the danger is diminishing. Yet we do know people who are in need of your help now, your healing, your strength, or your comfort. And so hear us as we name these folk to you before you now in our hearts. prayers we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
And now may you know grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.